Chapter Five of *The Warlord of Mars* by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. *The Warlord of Mars*, Chapter Five, on the Caolian Road. If there be a fate that is sometimes cruel to me, there surely is a kind and merciful providence which watches over me. As I toppled from the tower into the horrid abyss below, I counted myself already dead. And Thurid must have done likewise, for he evidently did not even trouble himself to look after me, but must have turned and mounted the waiting flyer at once. Ten feet only I fell, and then a loop of my tough leathern harness caught one of the cylindrical stone projections in the tower's surface and held. Even when I had ceased to fall I could not believe the miracle that had preserved me from instant death, and for a moment I hung there, cold sweat exuding from every pore of my body. But when at last I had worked myself back to a firm position I hesitated to ascend, since I could not know that Thurid was not still awaiting me above. Presently, however, there came to my ears the whirring of the propellers of a flyer, and as each moment the sound grew fainter I realized that the party had proceeded toward the south without assuring themselves as to my fate. Cautiously I retraced my way to the roof, and I must admit that it was with no pleasant sensation that I raised my eyes once more above its edge, but to my relief there was no one in sight, and a moment later I stood safely upon its broad surface. To reach the hangar and drag forth the only other flyer which it contained was the work of but an instant. And just as the two Thurn warriors whom Matt Tai Sheng had left to prevent this very contingency emerged upon the roof from the tower's interior, I rose above them with a taunting laugh. Then I dived rapidly to the inner court where I had just seen Wula, and to my immense relief found the faithful beast still there. The twelve great baths lay in the doorways of their lairs eyeing him and growling ominously, but they had not disobeyed Thuvia's injunction, and I thanked the fate that had made her their keeper within the Golden Cliffs, and endowed her with the kind and sympathetic nature that had won the loyalty and affection of these fierce beasts for her. Wula leapt in frantic joy when he discovered me, and as the flyer touched the pavement of the court for a brief instant he bounded to the deck beside me and in the bear-like manifestation of his exuberant happiness all but caused me to wreck the vessel against the courtyard's rocky wall. Amid the angry shouting of Thurn guardsmen we rose high above the last fortress of the Holy Thurns, and then raced straight toward the northeast and Kaol, the destination which I had heard from the lips of Matai Shang. Far ahead, a tiny speck in the distance, I made out another flyer late in the afternoon it could be none other than that which bore my lost love and my enemies. I had gained considerably on the craft by night, and then, knowing that they must have sighted me and would show no lights after dark, I set my destination compass upon her, that wonderful little Martian mechanism which, once attuned to the object of destination, points away toward it, irrespective of every change in its location. All that night we raced through the Barsoomian void, passing over low hills and dead sea-bottoms, above long deserted cities and populous centers of red Martian habitation upon the ribbon-like lines of cultivated land which bordered the globe-encircling waterways which earthmen call the canals of Mars. Dawn showed that I had gained appreciably upon the flyer ahead of me. It was a larger craft than mine, and not so swift, but even so it had covered an immense distance since the flight began. The change in vegetation below showed me that we were rapidly nearing the equator. I was now near enough to my quarry to have used my bow-gun, but though I could see that Dejah Thoris was not on deck, I feared to fire upon the craft which bore her. Thurid was deterred by no such scruples, and though it must have been difficult for him to believe that it was really I who followed them, he could not very well doubt the witness of his own eyes and so he trained their stern-gun upon me with his own hands, and an instant later an explosive radium projectile whizzed perilously close above my deck. The black's next shot was more accurate, striking my flyer full upon the prow, and exploding with the instant of contact, ripping wide open the bow buoyancy tanks and disabling the engine. 
So quickly did my bow drop after the shot that I scarce had time to lash Woola to the deck and buckle my own harness to a gunwale ring, before the craft was hanging stern up and making her last long drop to the ground. Her stern buoyancy tanks prevented her dropping with great rapidity. But Thurid was firing rapidly now in an attempt to burst these also, that I might be dashed to death in the swift fall that would instantly follow a successful shot. Shot after shot tore past or into us. But by a miracle neither Woola nor I was hit, nor were the after-tanks punctured. This good fortune could not last indefinitely, and, assured that Thurid would not again leave me alive, I awaited the bursting of the next shell that hit, and then, throwing my hands above my head, I let go my hold and crumpled, limp and inert, dangling in my harness like a corpse. The ruse worked, and Thurid fired no more at us. Presently I heard the diminishing sound of whirring propellers and realized that again I was safe. Slowly the stricken flyer sank to the ground, and when I had freed myself and Woola from the entangling wreckage, I found that we were upon the verge of a natural forest, so rare a thing upon the bosom of dying Mars that outside of the forest in the valley door beside the lost Sea of Chorus I never before had seen its like upon the planet. From books and travellers I had learned something of the little-known land of Keol which lies along the equator almost halfway round the planet to the east of Helium. It comprises a sunken area of extreme tropical heat, and is inhabited by a nation of red men varying but little in manners, customs, and appearance from the balance of the red men of Barsoom. I knew that they were among those of the outer world who still clung tenaciously to the discredited religion of the Holy Therns, and that Matai Shang would find a ready welcome and safe refuge among them, while John Carter could look for nothing better than an ignoble death at their hands. The isolation of the Kaolians is rendered almost complete by the fact that no waterway connects their land with that of any other nation, nor have they any need of a waterway since the low swampy land which comprises the entire area of their domain self-waters their abundant tropical crops. For great distances in all directions, rugged hills and arid stretches of dead sea-bottom discourage intercourse with them, and since there is practically no such thing as foreign commerce upon warlike Barsoom, where each nation is sufficient to itself, really little has been known relative to the court of the Jeddak of Keol and the numerous strange but interesting people over whom he rules. Occasional hunting parties have travelled to this out-of-the-way corner of the globe, but the hostility of the natives has usually brought disaster upon them, so that even the sport of hunting the strange and savage creatures which haunt the jungle fastnesses of Keol has of later years proved insufficient lure even to the most intrepid warriors. It was upon the verge of the land of the Keols that I now knew myself to be, but in what direction to search for Dejah Thoris, or how far into the heart of the great forest I might have to penetrate, I had not the faintest idea but not so Woola. Scarcely had I disentangled him than he raised his head high in the air and commenced circling about at the edge of the forest. Presently he halted, and, turning to see if I were following, set off straight into the maze of trees in the direction we had been going before Thurid's shot had put an end to our flyer. As best I could, I stumbled after him down a steep declivity beginning at the forest's edge. Immense trees reared their mighty heads far above us, their broad fronds completely shutting off the slightest glimpse of the sky. It was easy to see why the Kaolians needed no navy. Their cities, hidden in the midst of this towering forest, must be entirely invisible from above, nor could a landing be made by any but the smallest flyers, and then only with the greatest risk of accident. How Thurid and Matai Shang were to land I could not imagine, though later I was to learn that to the level of the forest top there rises in each city of Keol a slender watchtower which guards the Keolians by day and by night against the secret approach of a hostile fleet. To one of these the Hecador of the Holy Therns had no difficulty in approaching, and by its means the party was safely lowered to the ground. As Woola and I approached the bottom of the declivity, the ground became soft and mushy, so that it was with the greatest difficulty that we made any headway whatever. 
slender purple grasses topped with red and yellow fern-like fronds, grew rankly all about us to the height of several feet above my head. Myriad creepers hung festooned in graceful loops from tree to tree, and among them were several varieties of the Martian man-flower, whose blooms have eyes and hands with which to see and seize the insects which form their diet. The repulsive callet tree was too much in evidence. It is a carnivorous plant of about the bigness of a large sagebrush, such as dots our western plains. Each branch ends in a set of strong jaws, which have been known to drag down and devour large and formidable beasts of prey. Both Woola and I had several narrow escapes from these greedy, arboreous monsters. Occasional areas of firm sod gave us intervals of rest from the arduous labor of traversing this gorgeous twilight swamp, and it was upon one of these that I finally decided to make camp for the night, which my chronometer warned me would be soon upon us. Many varieties of fruit grew in abundance about us, and as Martian callets are omnivorous, Woola had no difficulty in making a square meal after I had brought down the viands for him. Then, having eaten too, I lay down with my back to that of my faithful hound, and dropped into a deep and dreamless sleep. The forest was shrouded in impenetrable darkness when a low growl from Woola awakened me. All about us I could hear the stealthy movement of great padded feet, and now and then the wicked gleam of green eyes upon us. Arising, I drew my longsword and waited. Suddenly a deep-toned, horrid roar burst from some savage throat almost at my side. What a fool I had been not to have found safer lodgings for myself and Woola among the branches of one of the countless trees that surrounded us! By daylight it would have been comparatively easy to have hoisted Woola aloft in one manner or another, but now it was too late. There was nothing for it but to stand our ground and take our medicine, though from the hideous racket which now assailed our ears, and for which that first roar had seemed to be the signal, I judged that we must be in the midst of hundreds, perhaps thousands, of the fierce, man-eating denizens of the Kaolian jungle. All the balance of the night they kept up their infernal din, but why they did not attack us I could not guess, nor am I sure to this day unless it was that none of them ever venture upon the patches of scarlet sward which dot the swamp. When morning broke they were still there, walking about as in a circle, but always just beyond the edge of the sward. A more terrifying aggregation of fierce and bloodthirsty monsters it would be difficult to imagine. Singly and in pairs they commenced wandering off into the jungle shortly after sunrise, and when the last of them had departed Woola and I resumed our journey. Occasionally we caught glimpses of horrid beasts all during the day, but fortunately we were never far from a sward island, and when they saw us their pursuit always ended at the verge of the solid sod. Toward noon we stumbled upon a well-constructed road running in the general direction we had been pursuing. Everything about this highway marked it as the work of skilled engineers, and I was confident, from the indications of antiquity which it bore, as well as from the very evident signs of its being still in everyday use, that it must lead to one of the principal cities of Kaol. Just as we entered it from one side a huge monster emerged from the jungle upon the other, and at sight of us charged madly in our direction. Imagine, if you can, a bald-faced hornet of your earthly experience, grown to the size of a prize Hereford bull and you will have some faint conception of the ferocious appearance and awesome formidability of the winged monster that bore down upon me. Frightful jaws in front, and mighty poison sting behind, made my relatively puny longsword seem a pitiful weapon of defense indeed. Nor could I hope to escape the lightning-like movements or hide from those myriad facet eyes which covered three-fourths of the hideous head permitting the creature to see in all direction at one and the same time. Even my powerful and ferocious Woola was as helpless as a kitten before that frightful thing. But to flee were useless, even had it ever been to my liking to turn my back upon a danger, so I stood my ground, Woola snarling at my side, my only hope to die as I had always lived, 
fighting. The creature was upon us now, and at the instant there seemed to me a single slight chance for victory. If I could but remove the terrible menace of certain death hidden in the poison sacks that fed the sting, the struggle would be less unequal. At the thought I called to Woola to leap upon the creature's head and hang there, and as his mighty jaws closed upon that fiendish face, and glistening fangs buried themselves in the bone and cartilage and lower part of one of the huge eyes, I dived beneath the great body as the creature rose, dragging Woola from the ground, that it might bring its sting beneath and pierce the body of the thing hanging to its head. To put myself in the path of that poison-laden lance was to court instant death, but it was the only way. And as the thing shot lightning-like toward me, I swung my longsword in a terrific cut that severed the deadly member close to the gorgeously marked body. Then, like a battering-ram, one of the powerful hind legs caught me full in the chest and hurled me, half-stunned and wholly winded, clear across the broad highway and into the underbrush of the jungle that fringes it. Fortunately, I passed between the boles of trees. Had I struck one of them, I should have been badly injured, if not killed, so swiftly had I been catapulted by that enormous hind leg. Dazed though I was, I stumbled to my feet and staggered back to Woola's assistance, to find his savage antagonist circling ten feet above the ground, beating madly at the clinging callet with all six powerful legs. Even during my sudden flight through the air I had not once released my grip upon my longsword, and now I ran beneath the two battling monsters, jabbing the winged terror repeatedly with its sharp point. The thing might easily have risen out of my reach, but evidently it knew as little concerning retreat in the face of danger as either Woola or I, for it dropped quickly toward me, and before I could escape had grasped my shoulder between its powerful jaws. Time and again the now useless stub of its giant sting struck futilely against my body, but the blows alone were almost as effective as the kick of a horse, so that when I say futilely I refer only to the natural function of the disabled member. Eventually the thing would have hammered me to a pulp. Nor was it far from accomplishing this when an interruption occurred that put an end forever to its hostilities. From where I hung a few feet above the ground I could see along the highway a few hundred yards to where it turned toward the east, and just as I had about given up all hope of escaping the perilous position in which I now was, I saw a red warrior come into view from around the bend. He was mounted on a splendid thoat, one of the smaller species used by red men, and in his hand was a wondrous long, light lance. His mount was walking sedately when I first perceived them, but the instant that the red men's eyes fell upon us a word to the thoat brought the animal at full charge down upon us. The long lance of the warrior dipped toward us, and as thoat and rider hurtled beneath the point passed through the body of our antagonist. With a convulsive shudder the thing stiffened, the jaws relaxed, dropping me to the ground, and then, careening once in mid-air, the creature plunged head foremost to the road full upon Woola, who still clung tenaciously to its gory head. By the time I had regained my feet, the red man had turned and ridden back to us. Woola, finding his enemy inert and lifeless, released his hold at my command and wriggled from beneath the body that had covered him, and together we faced the warrior looking down upon us. I started to thank the stranger for his timely assistance, but he cut me off peremptorily. "'Who are you?' he asked. "'Who dare enter the land of Kaol and hunt in the royal forest of the Jeddak?' Then, as he noted my white skin through the coating of grime and blood that covered me, his eyes went wide, and in an altered tone he whispered, "'Can it be that you are a holy thern?' I might have deceived the fellow for a time, as I had deceived others, but I had cast away the yellow wig and the holy diadem in the presence of Matai Shang, and I knew that it would not be long ere my new acquaintance discovered that I was no thern at all. "'I am not a thern,' I replied, and then, flinging caution to the winds, I said, "'I am John Carter, Prince of Helium, whose name may not be entirely unknown to you.' If his eyes had gone wide when he thought that I was a holy thern, they fairly popped now that he knew that I was John Carter. I grasped my long-sword more firmly as I spoke the words which I was sure would precipitate an attack, 
but to my surprise they precipitated nothing of the kind. "'John Carter, Prince of Helium,' he repeated slowly, as though he could not quite grasp the truth of the statement. "'John Carter, the mightiest warrior of Barsoom!' And then he dismounted, and placed his hand upon my shoulder, after the manner of most friendly greeting upon Mars. "'It is my duty, and it should be my pleasure, to kill you, John Carter,' he said. "'But always in my heart of hearts have I admired your prowess and believed in your sincerity, the while I have questioned and disbelieved the Therns and their religion. It would mean my instant death were my heresy to be suspected in the court of Kulan Tith. But if I may serve you, Prince, you have but to command Torkar Bar, Dwar of the Kaolian Road." Truth and honesty were writ large upon the warrior's noble countenance, so that I could not but have trusted him, enemy though he should have been. His title of Captain of the Kaolian Road explained his timely presence in the heart of the savage forest, for every highway upon Barsoom is patrolled by doughty warriors of the noble class, nor is there any service more honourable than this lonely and dangerous duty in the less frequented sections of the domains of the red men of Barsoom. Torkar Bar has already placed a great debt of gratitude upon my shoulders, I replied, pointing to the carcass of the creature from whose heart he was dragging his long spear. The red man smiled. It was fortunate that I came when I did, he said. Only this poisoned spear pricking the very heart of a Sith can kill it quickly enough to save its prey. In this section of Kaol we are all armed with a long Sith spear, whose point is smeared with the poison of the creature it is intended to kill. No other virus acts so quickly upon the beast as its own. Look, he continued, drawing his dagger and making an incision in the carcass a foot above the root of the sting, from which he presently drew forth two sacks, each of which held fully a gallon of the deadly liquid. Thus we maintain our supply, though were it not for certain commercial uses to which the virus is put, it would scarcely be necessary to add to our present store, since the Sith is almost extinct. Only occasionally do we now run upon one. Of old, however, Kaol was overrun with the frightful monsters that often come in herds of twenty or thirty, darting down from above into our cities and carrying away women, children, and even warriors. As we spoke, I had been wondering just how much I might safely tell this man of the mission which brought me to his land, but his next words anticipated the broaching of the subject on my part, and rendered me thankful that I had not spoken too soon. "'And now as to yourself, John Carter,' he said, "'I shall not ask your business here, nor do I wish to hear it. I have eyes and ears and ordinary intelligence, and yesterday morning I saw the party that came to the city of Kaol from the north in a small flyer. But one thing I ask of you, and that is, the word of John Carter that he contemplates no overt act against either the nation of Kaol or its Jeddak. You may have my word as to that, Torkar Bar, I replied. My way leads along the Kaolian road, away from the city of Kaol, he continued. I have seen no one, John Carter least of all, nor have you seen Torkar Bar, nor ever heard of him. You understand? Perfectly, I replied. He laid his hand upon my shoulder. This road leads directly into the city of Kaol, he said. I wish you fortune. And vaulting to the back of his throat, he trotted away without even a backward glance. It was after dark when Wula and I spied through the mighty forest the great wall which surrounds the city of Kaol. We had traversed the entire way without mishap or adventure, and though the few we had met had eyed the great Kalat wonderingly, none had pierced the red pigment with which I had smoothly smeared every square inch of my body. But to traverse the surrounding country and to enter the guarded city of Kulan Tith, Jeddak of Kaol, were two very different things. No man enters a Martian city without giving a very detailed and satisfactory account of himself, nor did I delude myself with the belief that I could for a moment impose upon the acumen of the officers of the guard to whom I should be taken the moment I applied at any one of the gates. My only hope seemed to lie in entering the city surreptitiously under the cover of darkness, and once in, 
trust to my own wits to hide myself in some crowded quarter where detection would be less liable to occur. With this idea in view I circled the great wall, keeping within the fringe of the forest, which is cut away for a short distance from the wall all about the city, that no enemy may utilize the trees as a means of ingress. Several times I attempted to scale the barrier at different points, but not even my earthly muscles could overcome that cleverly constructed rampart. To a height of thirty feet the face of the wall slanted outward, and then for almost an equal distance it was perpendicular, above which it slanted in again for some fifteen feet to the crest. And smooth, polished glass could not be more so. Finally I had to admit that at last I had discovered a Barsoomian fortification which I could not negotiate. Discouraged, I withdrew into the forest beside a broad highway which entered the city from the east, and with Woola beside me, lay down to sleep. End of chapter 5